Okay, well, thanks so much for joining me, Irene. I am so happy to have you with us. I met you at the World Massage Festival last year, and it was just such a pleasure to meet you. You have such an aura of goodness and wholesome beauty about you. I was drawn to you immediately. Oh. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for saying that. That's nice to hear. Of course. Now, I understand you have a new book out. I, I do. And I shipped off my last version, so I don't have it to hold. <laughs> well, that's okay. I know you can find it on social media. There's a lot of pictures out there, and, and we can post a link below on how to get the book. But tell us a little bit about your book. Mm. So now I've been saying it took me three years to write based on 30 plus years of wisdom. <laughs> so it's, you know, as anybody who's ever written a book, they can attest it's a process. My goal was to get it done in an hour, in a, in a year, in an hour would have been great in a year. And it took me, you know, some extra time. There was COVID hit, all that stuff. But towards the end, what I really found interesting from my own perspective was why was I dragging my feet? And I, I, I was done. I just needed to sort of like review it again, one more final edit and then push send to my editor. But I kept dragging my feet and I couldn't figure it out. And then I, I realized why. And I am a perpetual learner and I'm always learning. So 30 plus years I've been in the health and wellness world. I'm, I'm old. I just had a birthday. And so you know, you would think, okay, I kind of know it all. I kind of got it down. My book will be concise and complete. But in the back of my head, there was always like, no, I'm I'm trying a new thing at the wellness center. I'm learning a new thing in rehab, you know? And so I just didn't want to finish it and literally close the book on it. Because what about tomorrow when I find out there's this new thing I want to start incorporating? And I finally had to just say, let's do it. It is complete at this moment in time, and I can always write a second edition. And, you know, I guess that's sort of just a lesson in my life. A moral of my story is there's always more to, to learn and explore and life's a journey. And it's, and it's fun if you have an open perspective of like, hey, what's next? What can we do now? Yeah. And that's how I live my life. <laughs> so that's the book, Design Your Dream Practice. Yes. Based on a program that I used to teach a live training, design your dream practice. And basically it's how I, you know, how I came up with what I'm doing now in San Francisco and all of the coaching and consulting and, and teaching and presenting and educating I've done over the years. I just put it all in a book. That's awesome. You know, I took an art class one time and I remember at, at the end of the class, I was done painting my picture and I asked the instructor, when do you know when you're done? Yeah. And she said, when you, when you think you're almost done, you're done. <laughs> and I was like, that's such an interesting answer, you know, but I can see where, you know, your life isn't over. Yeah. You're, you continue to learn more and you want to put it all in the book. And I can yep. totally appreciate that feeling of I'm not done yet. Yeah. So, I'm so proud of you for being done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's also somebody said to me, and I and I was really grateful for their advice. They said, Irene, the sooner you get it out, more people can benefit from it. Because right now it's in here and it's, you know, with my coaching clients. But and the, and that that was like the the motivator. That and yes, you can always add a second edition. Was really just get it out there. It's as good as it is right now, and people can still you know, the, the tagline is maximize revenue, thrill clients and avoid burnout. So it, that people can start doing that right away. And I finally just said, yes, let's do it. That's amazing. Now I'm sure there's millions of tips and tricks in there on how to create your best practice for you. What, what would you like to share with us? Little teaser. <laughs> well, on page 12. Hey. Yeah. So here's the thing. I, I started just for people who don't know my my story, I moved to San Francisco in 1987 to start the world's first international fitness cruise company. There was no such thing. So people would go on cruises and they would eat and drink and gamble and, you know, maybe 
play a ping pong or something like that or shuffleboard or whatever. And they'd go on these cruises. And I started my first job out of college was as a health and fitness director on a cruise ship, American Hawaii Cruises. And we sailed around the Hawaiian Islands. And I did that for two years. And it was amazing. But I realized there was a need for people to be able to travel and stay fit. So I moved to San Francisco because at that point, cruise lines were based out of San Francisco, L.A. or Miami. Didn't want to live in Miami. Didn't want to live in L.A. I had a sister and an old boyfriend in San Francisco. And it was a cool city. I was like, okay, I'm moving there. So I moved to San Francisco to start this travel company, but I had no money. <laughs> I had no, you know, there was, this is before crowdsourcing and all of that Kickstarter. And so I had to figure out how to make some money. I taught aerobics and I was a personal fitness trainer and I would unofficially massage people. So people, so that, that old boyfriend said, you know, Irene, you're really good at massaging. Why don't you just go to school and figure out how to do a real massage? And then that way you can, you know, see a client or two in a day, make a hundred dollars. Cause at that point it was like $50 an hour and then have the whole rest of your time to devote to this travel business. That was the best advice because I literally could take, instead of working an eight hour day and make a hundred bucks, I could do it in a concise time. I took the shortest program, 102 hours of massage school. And I, because my degree was in rehab therapy, I, you know, kind of tested out of a lot of the anatomy and physiology and stuff. And I started doing massages to make money to go on the cruises, but then I'd be gone on the cruises and my clients would be like, where are you going? (laughs) Hello, why are you leaving us? So I started to hire therapists to see my clients when I was gone and that worked great. And then I started realizing, Hey, there's something really here. I was doing both. I was doing massage. I was, or I was doing everything, doing massage, teaching aerobic, doing personal training and going out on these cruises. And I started to have to really be effective and efficient with my time when I was in San Francisco. And not only in San Francisco during that week or two that I was in town, but I had to be really effective in my session. So I started to develop this method, this approach that I now call active modulation therapy, the diamond method which is a movement and manual-based modality. Well, I was getting results that would normally take an hour in 10 minutes. Like people's migraines would disappear. Their shoulder had more movement, like all the orthopedic complaints or fibromyalgia or, you know, migraine would problems would really be able to be addressed in a super short time. So when I started getting those results, people would say, how are you doing that? And they'd also say, how are you getting so many clients? How do you get all those referrals? How are you attracting your dream clients? So just over the years, people asking me these questions, watching what I was doing. I was always really good at marketing just innately. And I was, I never had to go looking for clients. And so people would say, well, what, you know, what are you doing? And so I started teaching and training. And then eventually these concepts became much more formalized. And they're all in the book. So, so literally this book, I'm, I'm so proud of it because yes, it was a labor of love, but I, I truly believe any health and fitness or wellness provider who wants a different approach, if they take the concepts in the book, they'll see that it really is oftentimes the opposite of what a lot of business consultants suggest. And it's as my business transformed and evolved and how, how I personally matured, it came, it came into effect because, you know, when I was single, like I write in the book, when I was single, I could work 12 hour days, right? Like who cares? But when I got married and had a kid, all of a sudden, uh uh-uh, I wanted to be home with my husband and my child. And so I realized again, I had to be much more efficient with my time. We had an open to the public practice. So in the book, I talk about open to the public, which is what we were at the beginning. Basically, literally on the door, and many of your audience has this on the door where it says walk-ins welcome. That's an open to the public practice. Nothing wrong with it. It's based on volume. More clients, the better. The more people, the better. Well, we have three treatment rooms in our location. We're, We're in a 120 year old Victorian building. It's beautiful. So we have three treatment rooms. I have a little exercise room with treadmill and weights and things. We, our goal was pack those rooms, <laughs> pack those therapists, 
how many appointments? So it's funny when I hear like in Facebook and people will say, well, you know, how many clients can you see in a day? And, and the goal is the more, the better, right? Well, I was there. I was doing eight hours of deep tissue every day. And I was making big money. Way back then, I was making $8,000. I did the math for, for the book. My revenue back when I started my practice was equivalent to about a quarter of a million dollars now. Just me, just doing my, my health and fitness and wellness and massage and training. And I, I realized it's because I, didn't, I treated my business as a business and I was packing people in. So I was exhausted. I started to burn out. And I realized over time, I wanted to have a more, what I call now a precise private practice. And so again, you asked, what are the nuggets? The nugget teaches how to transition from an open to the public volume-based practice to a precise private practice where the focus is on fewer clients, higher value. So premium pricing, premium service, world-class expectations, not cutting corners. And, and again, this was an evolution because when I started, I was cutting corners. I had to, I didn't have any, any choice. So I get, you know, the shoestring, I, I get it. I understand it. I did it. And now we're working with fewer people, but we only accept clients. We know for sure we can help. So we turn away people because again, we're not just taking anybody and everybody. So we do a really thorough screening. We, we are sure we can address their needs. And then we figure out the treatment plan. And it's, it's me and a few other providers. And, and people are thrilled. And so, you know, gone are the days where we had to worry about, ooh, a bad review on Yelp. Well, there's not, that doesn't happen because we screen people. So like, it's, it's not even a thing anymore. Right. Now I get a little email that says you have a new review and I'm like, yay, what's it going to say? I'm not like, oh yeah. And so, you know, it's just a different, it's just a different way of going to market. Fewer clients, higher value, pre-screening, really understanding who your dream clients are, who you do your best work with and focus on them. It sounds to me like you're really educating your audience and your and your massage therapists about how to really hone in on their niche and picking their <laughs> ideal target mark. Well, I'll, we talk about niching and all of that. I have a, a concept I, I use, the, the neon sign formula. And basically, like a neon sign above your head, like I specialize in migraine relief. But then the neon sign that also shines over your dream client. So when you're talking with them, you can say, oh, this person is my dream client. This one's not. But it doesn't go back to like, you know, some people teach avatars, you know, like Sally, she's a 45-year-old housewife. It, no, <laughs> we don't worry about that. We look at either their careers because, again, if somebody is a dental hygienist over somebody's mouth, right, we just know physically there's going to be some stuff that we either can address or or not. So their careers, their their symptoms, right? So again, I I personally focus with with patients and clients who have migraine. So I can address, you know, a male, a female, a kid, a, a, a housewife, or whoever who has a migraine. It doesn't really matter what their niche is because I focus on the symptom and what are we trying to help them achieve or relieve. I would talk about there's only two things. So if you can identify who your dream client is based on what you can help them achieve, right? Like train for a marathon or run faster or whatever, or what you can help them relieve, swelling, restricted range of motion, you know, insomnia, whatever the symptom relief is that you can help them identify and then treat that. That's what I think we need to focus on. So niching, you know, based on how you look at it, yes, it's always better, I think, to be more focused for so many reasons, Julie. You know, if you, like in my case, if it was migraine, I don't need to read about plantar fasciitis. <laughs> Doesn't really play in here. I just need to really focus my education, to stay current on much more of a finite 
body of, of, of knowledge. So our, our staying current is easier. People talking about us and, and referring is way easier when we're known as the specialist for blank or blank and blank, right? It doesn't have to only be one. It's almost like a, a doctor that has a speciality. You know, you want to go to a rheumatologist if you have arthritis or you go to an orthopedic doctor if you, you know, and you're finding that instead of going to a general practitioner, right, you, you, you do have a lot, you can make a lot more money per client. If you look at it that way, more income per client, if you do have that speciality, if you narrow it down to what your speciality is. Now, yep. Specialists always make more money than generalists. Yes. And there's a higher level of expectation, though, of specialists. And I, you know, we can just take a simple example that I use often is like if you have a dog that needs a vet, you can go to a general vet that specializes in rabbits and snakes and dogs and cats, or you can go to a dog vet, which is better, or, you know, you can go to a poodle vet. Well, that, if you have a poodle, you're going to be like, that, that person knows my dog. Yeah. And, and therefore you're willing to pay more for that specialty. Yes. And you're going to ask specific questions about poodles in general. Is this specific <laughs> to this type of dog? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do think the higher expectation is, you know, necessary for your clients to, to be able to justify the higher price too. Yes. And so for practitioners who are brand new, work with everybody, get a feel. You know, I used to work with athletes. That was my thing. I thought I wanted to work with pro, pro athletes and it was great and it was hard and it was physically exhausting lifting a big, you know, 50 pound arm. And I decided I also didn't like the whole mentality behind that. So there was a lot of trial and error. I have chronic neck pain because of a spinal cord injury. So that was sort of my focus and back pain. And then migraines started. And so now that's my thing, but it took me a while to get there. And so there's nothing wrong with, if you're beginning, try it all out, see what works, see what you like, see what you enjoy. And if you have a personal experience yourself, or maybe someone you love that you've helped be a caregiver for, gives you an insight that you cannot read in a book. Mm -hmm. And that's invaluable. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, I've talked a lot about personal experiences and personal health problems that we've gone through in our lives and how much that influences the path that we take in our own massage therapy career. And I know mm -hmm. that's affected you. I've heard a lot of your story. Do you want to share a little bit of that with our audience? My story as far as my breaking my neck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing that your mom says, be careful, you might break your neck. Well, I did. I, I was 15 years old. I, I grew up in Honolulu and every Sunday I would take the bus down to the beach. And there was a group of adults that would do at that time, it was called acro sports. So it's what the cheerleaders do now, the throws and the pyramids and the lifts and all of that. And I was the only teenager. Everybody else were, were adults and they would let me hang out with them. And we would work out every Sunday on beach mats. And this one particular Sunday was, it happened to be a, a competition, an international competition. And I was standing on my partner's shoulders and I was going to do a forward somersault into his arms. Our timing was off. And I basically, from the height of this adult man, did a head dive right into the mat. And I laid there, unable to move. Now, the grace was that I was not on a beach mat anymore. This time I was on gymnastics mat, so there was some cushion. But I, you know, I put my arms out to catch myself. They buckled, and I landed on my head and ended up rolling over, and I had had a compression fracture. C5 and 6. Well, as anybody who knows their anatomy and neurology knows, the higher the level, the, the more it impacts your body. So I could talk, I could breathe, I could move my face, but I couldn't move anything else. And luckily, the guy whose shoulders I was on happened to be 
and anesthesiologist. What are the chances that he knew immediately, uh uh-oh, neck injury, don't move, don't move her. His wife, who was there, was a nurse. So I had the best first aid care right there on, on the ground. You know, and again, this is a long time ago. Med- emergency medicine was different. They knew enough not to move my neck, suspected a neck injury. So they kind of scooped me up and they put me in an ambulance and took me sort of the back roads of Waikiki driving slowly. The ambulance guy actually held my head in traction because that was before neck collars and stuff. And I had broken my neck and there was, we didn't know at the time, but there was compression on my spinal cord. So they called my parents. My dad actually is a neuroanatomist, a professor at the University of Hawaii. So again, he understood all of the severity of what what was going on. And they said, well, we could do surgery or we could try traction and see if we can relieve the compression on our spinal cord. Again, I was 15 years old. I was really active. This was the summer, start of the summer. I want to do surgery, get in, get out. And they were like, nope, we're going to do traction instead. Because it's less invasive, right? Less chance of risk. So they screwed in. I don't know if you can see. I had a halo around my head. I had two screws in the front, two screws in the back, literally 50 pounds of weight pulling my head one way and 75 pounds of weight pulling my hips the other way to create traction. And I was like that on my back, staring straight at the ceiling for 64 days. Wow. You know, I've heard this story and I, I'm still shocked to hear it again. I mean, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, gosh, that's a long time to sit there. <laughs> gosh, it's a long time, especially when you're so young and I was so used to being active. But I have to tell you, Julie, you know, what the song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. And it it truly is. It gave me perspective, obviously. you're. I'm laying on my back. You know, how do you brush your teeth? Well, you brush and you spit and it goes into a thing. And, you know, <laughs> I didn't wash my hair for two months. I mean, there was just, you just, you just learn how to deal with it. And, and I was young and, you know, again, physical therapy at the time was really different than what it is now. I ended up actually having surgery anyway, because after that entire time, the, my bones had, the muscles had healed, but the bones had not fused. And so when they actually sat me up, I had to learn how to, you know, hold my head in place it, it, immediately because of being immobile for so long. But they sat me up the doctor actually helped me sort of walk down the hall. I say walk like in air quotes because I was I had no muscle tone. And then they did x-rays and they noticed from that 20 minutes, I guess, of me being up, the bones had slipped again. And so they just said, okay, we got to do surgery. Wow. So that whole time was sort of for naught. I ended it with surgery, spinal cord fusion, where they took a bone from my hip, fused it on did a la- laminectomy and a, and a fusion. And then they said, okay, see you later. Wow. And so I had to learn how to rehab myself and it took time. And then I read every book and, you know, learned how to do it. Luckily, again, my dad had the library books and, or the books in his library. And so I studied that and um, got my degree. It started me on the, my path, right? You know, we always wonder what would, you know, how we get pushed into one direction in our life. And this career, obviously, was based on that. And I don't know what I would do if it hadn't happened. But I got my degree in rehab therapy. And 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 that's why I'm here, <laughs> helping people get out of pain. I have to say, I'm very grateful that you're a part of our massage therapy community. And it breaks my heart what you went through. But at the same time, I'm so grateful mm-hmm. for your journey. For the rest mm-hmm. of us to mm-hmm. learn what you learned the hard way. Mm-hmm. Thank and- you. I, I I know there's so many of us in in the health and wellness world who are here because of our personal experience. And and you're right. Yeah, it was a tragic thing. And <laughs> here we are. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mm-hmm. mean, it's just incredible the the learning process, right? I mean. Like I said, you you learned it the hard way. And 
I think the rest of us just need to humble ourselves and listen to what yeah. you've you've been taught the hard way. And mm-hmm. and if we right. can just, you know, listen and read your book and pay attention to <laughs> what you've learned in your journey, I think hopefully we can glean some knowledge from that. You know, I do want to ask a question. One thing that we hear a lot in the massage industry is that, you know, none of us are really doing this for the money. We do it to help uh-huh. people. And mm-hmm. I feel like your book is kind of a good way to go, you know what, I can make money in this industry. It's not just about helping people, although that is a big reward for us. But there is a way to actually make some money without doing eight massages a day. I am here to say there is nothing wrong about wanting to be financially rewarded. Again, I started for the money. It was a quick way to make a quick Buck. And I, and to this day, that's, of course, I love helping people. It's incredibly rewarding to go to bed at night or to tell my husband, hey, today, this person who's had migraines for 30 years, you know, of course. And I have enough money because of this career to be able to send my daughter, she just finished private college, you know, to be able to take trips when we want, to not have to look at pricing if we want to. By like that's such a luxury, and money gives us choices. Gives us choices in everything from healthcare to food to where we live to where we go. You know everything, and so I think my experience with people's mentality of if we're in it in the health and healing world, money is sort of taboo. We don't talk about it. It's not. It should not be our motivator. I think it's misdirected. And I also think that a lot of people, and people are going to not like this comment, but they use it as an excuse because they don't want to learn or hire people to help them with their business. So they just go, well, I'm a healer. I'm going to be struggling. Or, well, I'm a healer. I can't charge that much. It's because they have that self-doubt. They don't have that confidence to be able to say, I am damn good at what I do. And my clients are lucky to work with me. And yes, you know, I have innate skills and learned skills and I'm going to charge accordingly. Now, here's the thing where a lot of people miss, and I talk about this in my book, Julie, is we can make a lot of money. Like again, it's premium prices for premium service. Service is two, two pronged. One is the clinical results. And the second is the whole experience the whole experience. So people pay for an experience and the outcome, right? The bottom line is if we charge enough, then we have enough money to donate or to give to charity or to volunteer our services. If we're just scraping by, nobody has the emotional or or physical resources, let alone the financial resources to volunteer three hours or five hours a week or a month, right? So that so money really is empowering for so many reasons. And right now, because again, I work, I, I literally take no more than four clients in any month. So I have lots of free time. I can give them a world-class experience. I don't sell my services by time. So it's not an hour of, active modulation therapy. It's a, it's a session of treatment. So if they need more time, I give them more time because I have the time. So it's a whole different paradigm shift. Yeah. It's definitely a different mentality. You know, I hired a professional coach, I don't know, four or five years ago to help me take my business to the next level. And one thing that she shared with me, and I'm going to share this with my podcast listeners for free. And this is a good place to insert this information which is, I am not motivated by money. I'm motivated by helping people. And she told me, she said, but money will help you help more people. That's right. And now I think of money as a tool to help more people rather than whatever it is for everybody else. Yes. A lot of people think money is the end goal. Money is the tool. 
what's the end goal? Like literally, they've done studies. Ask a million people what their what their life goal is. Ultimately, it comes down to what? Do you know, Julie? Leaving money for your kids? No. Ultimately, past past that. What's past that? that? Leaving a legacy? Happiness. Happiness. Okay. Happiness. Well, happiness. <laughs> you can have all the money in the world and not be happy. Right. But money can help you be happy. Again, because you can, be- you can get better health care. You can have better education. You can buy healthier foods. You can get your teeth fixed. You know, like there's just so much that money can do. But ultimately, the end goal, when they when they distill it down, what are people's human basic desire is to be happy. Happy comes from good health, good friend, lots of love, you know, healthy air, sunshine, nature, all of that good stuff. And that's what money does. So yes, I think when people see it from that perspective, like your business coach said, the more money you have, the more people you can help. And that's how I see it. I, I, we donate, you know, in our practice every single month, we, we have a program that I license to other clinics. It's called our, we give back campaign. Every single month we donate over $2,500 worth of services. Every single month. We've been doing that for 20 years, since 2003. And the only reason we can do that is because we have the money to be able to do that. That's so. incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and that's kind of just fill your heart with joy to be able to do that. You know? Oh, yeah. When people call and they'll say, like, really? You're really donating your services? <laughs> You know, and they're in tears and they are just so appreciative. And of course, it comes back in goodwill. It comes back because sometimes the clients will, oftentimes the clients will become clients and they gener- it generates revenue. But ultimately, if our goal is to give back to the community, it's, I call it a triple win. So it's a win for the community. It's a win for the client. And it's a win for the practice. That's awesome. So you have a book. You are a coach. And you take clients, correct? Well, that's just skimming the top, but yes. <laughs> my goal is to take all my experiences and help create shortcuts for providers so they don't have to take 30 years to figure it out. And, you know, it's a match for a lot of people, and it's certainly not a match for everybody. But the way we run our wellness center, a lot of smaller practices, when they're ready to leverage and bring on other providers, they wonder if should they structure them as employees or contractors or renters. Well, I've created a fourth option and I it's under what we call the FAST system. And it's how we run our wellness center and it works terrifically and it's legal <laughs> and ethical and all that stuff. And so I license that to other practices who don't want employees. It's most of the time, most health and wellness providers should not have their providers be contractors that le- li- literally is breaking employee- employment laws in most cases. So that should not even be considered. But if they don't want employees or renters, this is an option. So that's another sort of component of my business. Like I said, we license the We Give Back campaign. And that's, a, that's the only marketing campaign that a practice needs. Like that's all the marketing we do. And it's free to do. So we don't pay for ads. We don't do any of that stuff. We used to. Again, I used to have a paid uh, our ad in our local paper and, you know, that kind of thing. But now that I developed this campaign, we don't need to pay for advertising. And so I licensed that to other practices, one per city, because one, we don't want to dilute it. And it's brand new as far as licensing. So if anybody is listening and they want to get in on it, now is the time because we're gonna, you know, we're still working out the kinks and stuff. But I've had other practice owners use it and it's and I talk about it in the book. And it's amazing because again, it gives back to the community, it generates leads and it generates revenue. So so I do that. And then there's a, a fun new method of of therapy that's sort of been created from the rehab method, which is now something I want to bring to spas and health clubs and fitness centers and things that are, it's for muscle tension and stress, stress relief, as opposed to rehab. So it's less clinical 
And again, the goal with the diamond method of, of therapy is that the client is active. So as you know, typical massage, the client is passive. Typical physical therapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, all of those modalities, the client, the patient lays on the treatment table and the therapist does external stuff to their body. In the diamond method, and now what we're calling diamond active massage, the therapist is doing something, they're holding, but the client is moving. Julie, again, it's all about effective and efficient. It is so fast. The result, the muscle tension release, the, the stress release is so quick because the client is doing the movement. So it's an inside out result instead of the client waiting, wondering what is the therapist going to be doing? So it's really profound. So that's another thing that we're just starting to roll out. So if anybody wants to be the first in their neighborhood for that, that's really exciting. Because I mean, one thing that I've noticed about massage therapists is that we're not very good at marketing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're very yep. good at massaging and, and a lot of us are very good in the social networking area. But when it comes to marketing ourselves, it's very challenging and knowing what we're worth. That's another really hard one. And we've already kind of talked about money, but I, I do love the fact that you offer this program. So I, if anybody's listening, it sounds like this is a great opportunity. If you struggle in marketing, that mm -hmm. she can really, Irene's program can really help you. Oh, the week of, if somebody is looking to attract more clients, the we get back done, like just slam dunk. You have to, you have to, you know, you have to do it. You have to put the steps in place, but you're not selling. You're, you're literally reaching out to your community to donate, which comes back in spades. And so it feels better because you're giving, you're starting with giving versus asking. Yeah. And that's where people, they don't like that, right? They don't want to be pushy and they don't want to ask for the sale. They don't want to ask somebody to book. Well, there's a whole art to sales, which I teach and, and understanding that we're really, when, when a client says yes to booking an appointment with us, one tip I'll, I'll share is that we have to remember they're not saying yes to the appointment because they want to give us money. They're saying yes because of what it'll do for them, right? So just like me not getting my book out there, therapists not having clients get in their treatment rooms are withholding <laughs> the value and the, and the incredible support they can be giving to their clients just by having that table sit there empty. So if we can kind of change that paradigm again, change the mindset and recognizing the more clients we can serve, whether it's us one-on-one -on -one or the ripple effect, you know, the better, the better the world and, and it'll, and it financially benefits us as well. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that is incredible. I love this because we talk a lot about marketing on this podcast. I, I have a business marketing degree. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we throw out the terms niche and focus and target market and, you know, networking. And we say all these things, but, you know, not everybody, most everybody in the massage industry is it, struggling with marketing. And there are enough clients out there for all of us to help mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. need us and now mm -hmm. more than ever. So I love yes. your program. It sounds perfect. Thank you. Thank you. The people who've gone through it, again, it's kind of a different perspective because I'd rather have a client, have a therapist work with, you know, three clients or four clients in a day instead of eight and make the same money and really create a change in that person's life and the ripple effect. So that one client who comes in who had pain in their back, but they were now able to bend over and put their shoes on, they're going to go home. They're going to be a lot happier to their spouse and their kids and the dog and, you know, the ripple effect. And when they go back to work, they'll be more productive. And so I, I really want therapists to think, let me step back and change my goal from as many clients as I can get in my practice to really fine tuning, who do I do my best work with? Who do I enjoy? In marketing terms, you would call it, you're creating a pull in the market, right? You're, you're asking for those referrals, but 
I'll tell you, it is an opposite effect to most most massage mentors will tell you, do not discount, do not give away your services for free. Don't do that. Mm. And you do have a completely opposite approach to that. Yes. And, and there's some caveat. So I don't, I don't usually endorse discounting. There's, there's many ways that you can benefit clients instead of saying, Hey, $20 off today. Again, we used to do all that, so I know. <laughs> but there's ways of incenting clients to come in more often. And, and one of the focuses I want therapists to think about now, here's a takeaway. Instead of giving your clients an incentive to save a percentage by buying in bulk, right? Like buy five sessions, you'll get a six free, or buy five, you'll get 20%, whatever. Okay, that's an incentive based on they save money. However, how about if we make it, let's give them the incentive that instead of the money piece, move that aside, the fee is going to be the same, if not higher. But the incentive is because then they're going to get the clinical results that they originally came to you wanting. And so again, it's a skilled practitioner, though, who has the ability, the knowledge, the, the, the know-how to listen to their clients' questioning and requests, do a comprehensive assessment to make sure they know why that client's going to book in the first place, and then creating the treatment plan to know how to get them from here to here. That's the incentive if I can get you here. Not, oh, well, if you do five sessions, you're going to save 20 bucks or 200 bucks. So there's, there's discounts that are, that are beneficial for some people. A lot of coaches will say, give a new client initial, you know, a new client special or a new client rate. Mm -mm. Why are you giving the stranger the better deal than your loyal clients who come to you all the time? That doesn't make sense to me. It's kind of like a results driven approach. Mine is all about selling results. All about you've got it right, Jerry. Selling results. Selling the clinical outcome. I also encourage therapists to have a 100% guarantee. Oh, that sounds really scary. <laughs> it is. It's not for the weak of a uh, faint of heart. Mm -mm. You have to be able. So I'm all about ethics and, and actually teach the sales concept we teach is called the truth selling system. It's all about truth. So if I, let's have you be my client, Julie, you come in and you say, you know, my, my neck and shoulders are killing me. It's at an eight out of 10. And it's been like that for three months. And I, you know, I ask more questions and, and make sure I can address your needs. And I say, Julie, in three sessions, I am very confident that I can help you go from, you said an eight out of 10 now on a, on a pain scale to get down to at least a three or four out of 10. And let's just say three sessions. And if we don't get there, yeah, then, you know, I don't want your money because I didn't deliver what I promised. Well, again, most clients are going to be like, A, you're guaranteeing. I've never heard of that. And B, what do I have to lose? Right. So even if my fees are higher, if you've had this chronic thing and tried everything else and are just really ready to just be done with it, I know I would rather pay a higher premium fee to work with somebody who is confident they can help me. And if it doesn't work, I'm, I, maybe I wasted some time, but I certainly didn't waste yet more money because I've already paid for this and this and this and this and potion and lotion and treatments and all these other options. And so even that guarantee concept, people are like, how do you even do that? And it is scary unless you're really confident in your ability to assess and then be able to provide those results. So for the beginning therapist, it's, it, don't do it because you don't have that experience yet. But for the provider who's been around for a while, put your, literally put your money where your mouth is. Do, do, I think it's unethical to book somebody unless you know for sure you can help them. And that's the harsh reality. There's too many therapists who are pretending or winging it. Yeah, bake it till you make it. Yeah. Now I don't, you know, I mean, there is something to be said about fake it to make it like you have, have to demonstrate competency and confidence and stuff. Even if you might be shaken in your boots a little, that's okay. But you can't pretend that you know how to address somebody's frozen shoulder if you've never done it. 
I'd rather the therapist say, I've never worked with somebody with a frozen shoulder. I'm happy to try. I will do my research. I'll do the best I can, right? But not pretend. And then certainly make sure you're following up so you know how you're going to help help them get that end result. What is the end result? Many therapists book clients. They don't even know what the client's coming in for. Another thing I say is take those damn online bookings off your website. That's just asking for trouble. How, how do you know that anybody just scheduling with you can become a, a dream client of yours or is a dream client? Of you? Like to me, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Wow. I just, I mean, it kind of blows your mind to think about giving a guarantee like that. But, you know, if you are confident in your work and you have done your homework and you found your niche and you know exactly honing in, like you said, on on those particular things and you know your stuff, I mean, why not? Have you ever had to return people's money before? Yes. One, t- one time. What? That's it? The one time, and it was for a real reason, was he had neck stuff. Again, necks are my specialty. And I have, again, this is another concept, but it's called a results program where I charge a flat rate for a result. Okay. So the result for this one person, this man, was that I was going to help him resolve his neck, his chronic neck pain. He had had it for like a year. I don't remember the exact details. He was seeing a little bit of improvement. Now, again, I've been doing this long enough that I, I'm, I'm pretty aware of how big the increments of improvement are from session to session. He was on session three. He had seen a little bit of improvement, but not what I thought would be expected at this point. And I said, you know, I think there might be something else going on that we don't know about on the surface. Now, I'm very reluctant to send people off for MRIs and x-rays. And the reason is, is usually it gives us more information, but we all know that those imaging oftentimes will show all sorts of crazy stuff, does not indicate that that's the cause of the pain, right? Degenerative discs and arthritis and spondylolisthesis and everything else. And then it's like, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's causing the pain. So oftentimes I'll just tell people, don't even bother getting imaging. But in this person's case, I said, I think you need an MRI. Well, it turned out he had a tumor on his neck, in his spi- on his spinal cord. Obviously, I couldn't tell. He didn't know that. Nothing I could do. Yeah. He was the one person I refunded his money. I just did the full amount, even though I had worked with him for three sessions. Who cares, right? Let him go take care of his neck. <laughs> and at some point, he came back to me just, you know, w- without that, because he, he had had that addressed. But I don't, I've never had somebody say, oh, this isn't working. And there's a way to structure the guarantee. And it's very, the simplest piece that I can tell people about now is you structure it in a way where you know what the outcome is that you're guaranteeing. So if you can guarantee 100% of something, right, whether 100% range of motion or 100% pain reduction or reduced swelling or whatever the symptoms are, then that's what you guarantee. But if you're not confident that you can do 100%, you can guarantee a 10% improvement. Right. Or you can guarantee it if you help people, you know, uh, train for marathons and run 10 percent improvement in speed or hill climb, like whatever it is that you're doing. So you can quantify it in a smaller increment. But, you know, you can guarantee that. Yeah. Range of motion. I could see a lot of different things you can guarantee. So I could say I can, you know, if the person can only adduct this far, right? I could say, well, I, I, I'm confident I can get you at least 10% more range of motion. Yeah. Well, if, and then if the person hasn't had that for a long time, then the question back is, is if we can get you 10% improved range of motion, would that be worthwhile for you? Yeah. If they say yes, they're going to book with you. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's so ethical because you're not over-promising. Right. Right. Now, there are some professions in some countries and stuff, just whoever's listening, make sure you know about how to offer guarantees to, so you're not breaking any laws. But for most of us, we can guarantee something, right? We can guarantee that. And then you look at, everybody talks about competition. Who else in your city offers a guarantee? Unless they've read my book <laughs> or worked <laughs> with me, they probably don't. And then so there, you, there's no competition. There's, who would you rather go to, 
right? You would rather go to the vet for the poodle who can guarantee they're going to, you know, shrink that tumor with this radiation treatment versus the vet over here. No guarantee. I don't know. Which would you choose? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're going to go to the person who has given you a guarantee that you have confidence and faith that they're going to do it. Absolutely. You know, I want to touch on one more thing before we wrap up, but our last podcast, we talked a little bit about vulnerability and how Mm. we want to be confident yet present some vulnerability. And you kind of touched upon it with your last conversation we had, which is if you're not real confident in the ability to say, I'm going to give you a full range of motion, you know, start with 10%, you know, you might actually even admit, you know, I've never worked with frozen shoulder before. Mm -hmm. I would love to learn more about this. Will you help me learn? You know, Mm -hmm. you'd be my test candidate, Mm -hmm. so to speak, or my beta Mm -hmm. tester and we can work together, but it opens up that line of communication I think that the client then trusts you more because you're open and honest with them about that. It's all about being truthful. Yes. Yeah. The therapist gets in trouble when, they do, when they're not truthful. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was brand new in practice and I was interviewing to work at this chiropractor's office, he worked with all the San Francisco ballet people and the, you know, all, all people I wanted to uh, dance was my, my minor in school. So I wanted to work with him. I went to his office and he said, okay, Irene, do the demo and work on my scalenes. I didn't know where the scalenes were. <laughs> <laughs> so I just did my thing. And at the end, he goes, well, you're really nice. You're very professional. All that good touch, blah, blah, blah. But you didn't work on my scaling. Well, I was, I was, I was naive and I was trying to fake it till I made it. I should have literally just said, Lenny, like, here's a a little trick, not wear your scalenes, but put your finger exactly on the area that you want me to focus on. Uh, He would have touched it. I would have went, okay, (laughs) whether I knew the origin of insertions, at least I would have touched it (laughs) a little bit more. I love that. What a great little trick. I mean, if you forget what a muscle is or where an attachment is or where a bone is, if a client says, you know, I'm having a problem where my iliacus is and you're like, what's an iliacus? <laughs> Wait till we're yeah. in her. <laughs> yes. Unless, of course, they learned it on like Dr. Google and they're saying they're sciatica and they're touching their shoulder. Right? <laughs> then we know they might not know where well, you might know a little bit more than that. That's funny. <laughs> But yes, vulnerability and truth. Nobody wants you to fake it with their health, right? We we want the truth. And you don't need to be the world's best, but if you're one of the best and if you continue learning, you know, we're coming full circle to our conversation. If you continue learning and if you want to narrow the, your your scope of learning so you really have your few conditions or symptoms or or goals that you're going to be perfecting, your practice is just it's just there. You you can literally take it sky high. You can make as much money as you want. When clients see the value they get by working with you, the people who can afford it, easily afford it, will easily pay. I often talk about attracting clients who will happily pay you. Now, again, I wanted to work with inner city youth, homeless youth. I'm like, they need, they need touch, they need compassion, they need love, they need services. And then I went, but they don't af- can't afford it. So there's sponsorships and there's scholarships and grants and all that. But I realized I, I can donate my time to those people, that, that population, and make money by working with people who can happily, easily pay. So we do need to focus. And again, this is a business tip. We need to focus on the top percent of the people who are generating the, the higher levels of, of income, because then a session for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks or a $300 session, it's just a teeny little dip in their income. It's like us buying a sandwich. They're like, sure. But somebody who, you know, that sandwich is like, I can't, or I need to find the coins of my couch. Of course, they're not going to be able to afford their health care or their, their self-care. 
So we, we need to focus on the people who can easily afford it, the top half of the triangle. And then if we want, donate to the people who have less financial need. Thank you very much for joining me today, Irene. I can't wait to come back and listen to all these <laughs> great tips and that you've given us. I mean, I hope the audience really understands how valuable all of the information that you've given us is. And, and I hope that they go to your website and I hope that they buy your book. And just <laughs> I leave, hope so too. <laughs> yes, I think we have all this knowledge from you. Is there anything else you want to share before we stop? I think we've covered, we've covered so much this on the surface, these tips might be like, oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, that's okay. But really diving deep and, and adopting them or, you know, transitioning these concepts that have just literally just scratched the surface. If, if people take this and use it in their practice, even one of those tips, precise private practice, guaranteeing, charging premium pricing, not discounting, you know, like we covered, we covered a lot. Yeah. If they take one, if they take one tip, it can transform their practice where they're not struggling anymore. And they're literally living uh, the life they love. That's why I call it the dream practice, right? Because it allows you to have more fun and to play. So I, I welcome people to come, reach out to me on social media. I'm just on Facebook. I don't do Instagram or anything like that. But also my website, irenediamond.com, and then the Diamond Method. And even in my coaching and my consulting, I, I created those arms of my business as a precise private practice. So again, I don't accept anybody into even my therapy classes. Like it's not just anybody can sign up. They can enroll and then we have a conversation because I want to make sure it's going to be the right fit for them. I don't want their tuition if it's not going to, you know, be a match. So even in, in my coaching and consulting and educating I pre-screen who I work with because I want everybody to win. I want them to walk away saying, oh my gosh, that was so worth it. That's so, awesome. Yes. Yeah. Reach out to me if I can help. I'd, I'd be happy to for anybody listening. Thank you so much, Irene. I appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome, Julie. Yes, of course. It was an honor to be here. I'm happy to help. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>